Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, I know it's at the end of a long day, so I appreciate everybody taking the time to make it out for this one. I'm Joe Betts. Um, I'm joined by David Eads. We are both TLs of SIG API Machinery. And today, we're going to be talking about squashing pod trampolines. Before I go any bit further, let's explain what that means. Um, so a pod trampoline attack starts with a container breakout, followed by a compromise of the node that container is on, followed by an expansion of that attack out into the rest of the cluster, either by jumping to additional nodes or by escalating privileges. Sounds fun, right? So I figured I'd let my kids try it. Um, so what I did is I took a video game my kids have been playing called Progen Simulator and created the level. So the level has a container, um, a trampoline, and then a, and then a foam pit which represents access to the rest of your cluster. So I'm gonna go ahead and just let the kids start playing that. And while they do, let's explain a little bit about what's going on with the technology. So a container breakout can be tricky, but there can be misconfigurations in container infrastructure, there can be vulnerabilities in that infrastructure, or even in the kernel that can lead to opportunities to escape. When that happens, um, the um, attacker then has access to the rest of the node. For the purposes of this talk, we're just going to assume that container breakouts can happen, and our goal is to focus on minimizing the damage that happens when a container breakout does happen. <coughs> when an um, attacker gets out of a container, they're going to start using the resources available on the node to try and expand their attack out to the rest of your cluster. So they're going to have access to the volumes on that node. They're going to have access to the service accounts and secrets and things like that. And they're going to be looking for ways to leverage that as a way to trampoline off just that node, which is you know, only a small fraction of your infrastructure out to the rest of your infrastructure. Once they do that, they now have access to everything that they could hope for, right? Like they can get to all the information on all your nodes. If, they can, if you have any Surface account anywhere with escalated privileges, they're going to be able to get to that. And the thing they're going to be looking for the most is the things with the broadest permissions. And one of those things is a daemon set. Typically, when you have platform extensions, you're going to have um, things like CNI drivers that's on every single node. It's installed as a daemon set. So no matter where an attacker's um, pod lands when it's scheduled into your cluster, they're guaranteed to be on a node with your daemon set. Also, things like CNI drivers need access to resources in your cluster, so they tend to have permissions, and sometimes those permissions are too broad, and that gives them an opportunity to expand their attack. So what can we do about this? Our goal, as level designers, is to make the most unfair level possible, right? Like, let's add walls with spikes, let's add a lava pit, let's put spikes in the lava pit. Let's do anything we can to keep that attacker from getting to that trampoline. Um, and I'm proud to announce that after multiple years of work in both SIG API machinery and SIG auth, we finally have brought together a series of caps that solve this problem. This is a pretty big deal. Um, and we're gonna break down the explanation of how you can prevent these attacks into two parts. We're gonna talk about trampoline writes and then trampoline reads. So for trampoline writes, the thing that we're trying to prevent is an attacker from getting access to things beyond the node they're on. Now, let's imagine we have a CNI driver. It's installed on every node, and let's assume our attacker gets onto one of those nodes and has the service account for that CNI driver. That driver typically needs to communicate to the control point. So a reasonable way to do that would be to give that driver a service account that allows it to access some resource. I'm gonna call that resource widgets. We'll assume that's a CRD. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume that that CNI driver has a one-to-one -one relationship between a node and a widget resource. So for every node, in this example, I think we have node 001, there would be a widget 001, so a, a, a custom resource with exactly the same name. And what we want to do is allow that node to write only to that resource. If we do that, it can't expand out into the rest of the cluster because that information is tied only to that particular node. 
So one of the first enhancements that helps us solve this problem is service account node claims. What this feature does is it allows us to know for sure which node a request came from. This is part of the authentication system. Um, there is a claim in the token that gets sent up to the API server, and we can know for sure that that is what it claims to be. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and restrict the privileges of access to this widget resource when a node makes a request. We're gonna do that in two parts. First, we're gonna use traditional RBAC to restrict the privileges to only that widget's resource, but that still is way too broad. The attacker could modify any of the widget's resources in your cluster. And we can't restrict that further here because during the authorization phase of a request, we haven't cracked open the body of the request yet. So if you're doing a create, we don't know what the name of the thing you're creating is yet. So we're gonna add a secondary authorization check that happens after we have access to the body. And this is where we're going to add our second restriction that makes sure that a node can only access the widget for that node. The way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use a validating admission policy. This is a um, configuration of our admission chain that allows us to reject requests that don't match the criteria that we want. The first thing we're gonna do in that validating admission policy is configure it to match the widgets resource because that's what we care about. So we're gonna set up the criteria for that resource. We are gonna also add a second condition which says that we only care about requests that are coming from our service account, the service account we set up for our CNI driver. So we're using a cell expression for that. Now we've limited the requests that we're processing to just the ones that we care about, and we're gonna create two variables using cell. The first variable is the user node name, and what this is is it's accessing that um, node information that we already verified earlier and putting it into a variable that we can check. Now, if the node name is not present, that means that somebody is using the Surface account from outside of a node, and we're just gonna wanna reject that. So we're defaulting this to an empty string, and we're gonna check that later. The second variable we're, we're constructing is for the object's node name, and we're getting this from the requested object, which would be the widget that's being created or updated or deleted. And so we're, we're gathering that name. In the case of a delete, we need to get the name from the old object, so you see that handled here. If the user tries to do something sneaky, like a delete collection, which would delete all the resources, then this wouldn't match and then we would end up with an empty string. So we are deliberately handling that case, but it's a little subtle um, because it's not explicitly called out in the code. The last thing that we're gonna do is that we're gonna actually use all those variables we've built to perform two validation checks. The first is we're gonna require that you have a node name or we're gonna reject the request because for this service account, we only want it used from a node and we wanna know what that node was. The second condition we're gonna check is that node name matches the object name. This was the thing that we wanted to do to prevent the trampling effect, right? If you can only access the information for your node and no other node, you cannot trampling off that node. So that's it, that achieves um, preventing trampling rights. And I'm gonna hand it over to David to talk about reads. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so, you know, we're splitting out the reads and the writes, and it's a natural question to ask why. And it comes down to that one little phrase that, that Joe covered, which is in authorization, you don't have the body of the object. And specifically in admission, there is no admission on reads, and there's no admission on reads because there's no body to analyze. So you have to use a different technique to be able to secure these. So we're gonna play with a theoretical example where we have uh, a gizmo resource, and this gizmo resource has different classes, and we need to have controllers that handle individual classes. They're gonna be one for handling uh, golds and one for handling silvers. You can imagine this as, say, maybe an ingress class. 
Uh, we're starting here because it's not exactly the per node problem, but it lets us visualize those techniques before we start driving into mutability, right, where node names themselves can change. Uh, so how do we handle this? It's pretty obvious what we want to do. We want to be able to say, I want to list across namespaces, and I want to be able to do that with a field selector that says the class is gold, right? Uh, the problem that you have is prior to 132, only built-in types could have field selectors. So uh, lucky for us, in 132, uh, we now have an API that is stable in CRDs that allows you to specify which fields you want to select on. Now, there are some limitations to this, right? It's not as full-featured as built-ins. Uh, in particular, you can see it is a JSON path, so there's no advanced computation that's possible. Uh, it needs, also needs to point to a specific value. It can't be like a, a slice of values. You can't like pull out every, um, every value or mvar, for instance. It needs to be one value, it needs to be a string, an integer, or a Boolean. Uh, but it is here and it gives us some great new capability, right? So now you can actually go through and for your CRs, you're able to say uh, cube control get whatever you want with a field selector, uh, class equals gold. So this is great, this is something we need in order to be able to restrict, but it's obviously not restriction in and of itself because we have to stop this, right? You, you have to be able to say, well, yes, you can get the golds, but you can't get the silvers. Uh, and you also can't list across everything. Uh, so how do we do this? In mutating requests, we used admission, but as we noted here, read requests have no concept of it. There's no body to consider. Uh, so we're gonna step through an example of doing this from uh, cube control down all the way into the API server for how we use it. Uh, and I've got field and label selectors here just because both of them are pretty similar and you can restrict on both now. So uh, going from this cube control statement, we can see here, this is what it looks like on the URL line. These are actually query parameters. Um, and from there, on the server side, they get pulled down into an intermediate object called list options. If you guys are familiar with writing controllers, list options are those things that you set uh, for maybe feeding a specific namespace or a particular label set that you want to select on. There's a very similar spot in the QAPI server that does something very similar and pulls it out into something called request info that gets attached to a request and funneled through the handling chain. Um, there's a lot of standard information in there. It's basically everything that we can get without opening the body. So in 131, this got funneled into something called authorization attributes. This is what you would actually write your authorization webhook to use. This is what internally RBAC would use. And you can see that this, this right here doesn't have any field of labor selectors. On this request, they just aren't there. Um, and this right here is why RBAC never had any selectors that were ever added to it. They weren't on the info that we had. So in 132, this is now available on authorization attributes, right? You can actually see the field and label selectors. RBAC still doesn't have it but it exists and is sent out to authorization webhooks today. Uh, and this is intentional. We can make decisions based on it. So what decision would we actually want to make? This is what an authorization chain may ideally look like, right? There's no built-in authorizer for selectors today, but um, eventually there will be. And there's going to be some significant time period where we actually have to handle both the cases, right? If, if you're writing a platform extension, it's very unlikely that you're gonna write it only for one version, right? You often write them to span many, many versions, uh, and so you have to find a way to coexist with what is already present. And so here we're doing that by wiring up a denying webhook in front of RBAC. And what does this let you do? Um, so uh, I guess it lets you intercept that spot. Before RBAC says, yes, this is allowed, you're able to say, no, it isn't. Uh, but doing this actually requires uh, another <laughs> new feature. Ah, before I get there, uh, this is what it looks like in previous clusters. You won't be able to actually wire in the second webhook. And so for your migrating clusters, you actually still need to create the RBAC role. It's, uh, it's an over-provision. 
you know that you aren't going to want it long term, but you have to be able to get from where you are now to where you need to go, and breaking your existing consumers just isn't a great option. Uh, actually, this is exactly the same thing we did with the entry node authorizer. Uh, there was a separate set of RBAC roles that we would apply um, for pre-existing clusters. So, uh, if you're familiar with the command line flags for the QAPI server, you might be saying, David, that's great. You have one authorization webhook and you're already using it. Uh, and that's where you can get into the structured authorization configuration, right? So this is relatively new. I wanna say it came out, uh, went GA, either this release or the release before. Uh, and what this lets you do is to create an ordered list of authorizers where you can actually have multiple webhooks, but it also lets you target them, right? So this needs to run before RBAC, so it's gonna be ordered before it in the list, but you don't want the blast radius off of it to be excessively broad. So I've highlighted here the key pieces where I only wanna do it for certain requests. I only wanna do it for requests for gizmos, and I only wanna do it for a particular user. Uh, and that ensures if something goes wrong with your webhook or you have performance problems with your webhook, you don't bring down the rest of your cluster. Uh, so I guess one other note here, uh, you have full access to everything, these are cell expressions, and you have full access to everything in a subject access review. Uh, and if you don't know ahead of time what that is, if you're using this, you will, because you had to write the webhook. Uh, so, you know, that, that example was you know, mostly contrived, right? Are you gonna write a special webhook authorizer for random extension? Probably not, right? You're just gonna put that on some infrastructure set of nodes and just forget you ever had it. Uh, but I think that example is, is instrumental in describing what it is we're doing. And here's a look at what if we had this as nodes? And you remember what Joe was talking about, he had those node claims. And so here's where we, get in, where, where we get into something dynamic, where it's actually valuable to say, okay, I have this particular thing, I run my CNI on all sorts of clusters, I want to be able to restrict it everywhere, I will take the time to write this webhook and say, the node name claim has to match the node name uh, in the spec here, so before I can take any mutations. Uh, so you might be asking yourself, well, that's great. How is the kubelet ever safe, though? And I'm not gonna go deep into this, uh, but basically it comes down to the kubelet is inside the house. Uh, and because of this, we were able to build an authorizer that actually dynamically generates a graph and does a post restriction. But there's one detail that we actually finally did close in 1.32, uh, and that detail is the read permission on all pods. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about pods, it's like that very first request I indicated, where yes, every kubelet, if it's a good kubelet, lists only the pods for its particular spec node name. But if you were an evil kubelet, you could actually list for everything. What we did in 1.32 is we actually used those new fields to be able to restrict kubelets so that they can only request the, uh, the pods on their node. Uh, and so, you know, it's gonna be one happy, happy piece. Uh, now, how can we make this easier in the future? Because what I described here, it's pretty heavy. You're writing a webhook and, or validating admission policy and validating admission policy, you're then gonna have some way to restrict someone from changing the policy, and it's, it's gonna end up getting really messy. Uh, and here's where I actually want to make a call out to SIGOF. Uh, SIGOF is gonna have a deep dive on Friday, talking about RBAC++. They're looking at one particular way to do this. Uh, it's just in the incubation stages now. Uh, but I would actually encourage people to start thinking about what they want. What would their APIs look like. I've seen, uh, at least I can see Micah smiling back there. Uh, he certainly got some ideas and uh, I think it's worth considering and looking at because you do get a whole lot of additional power if we can make this easy to consume. Uh, another thing that we can do that we've been thinking about is what if we make the API server honor field and label selectors on every verb? Uh, this one seems a little strange when you first say it, like what would a field selector on a create even mean, uh, but if you're thinking about it, it would conceptually mean that the final 
final serialized content actually met that criteria. So it'd be very deep and late down in the storage flow uh, to be able to say, yes, this was valid. The reason you might do that is it becomes much easier to say every single request that I send for this particular resource will always have these field selectors. Right? And that means what Joe went through where he was talking about, I have these admission attributes and I have to overly broad grant and authorization and I clamp back down at admission, could end up being simpler. You could just do it at the authorization layer. Uh, and that's another thing that we need to do in order for us to be able to have guarantees about the security. Uh, one of these gaps would be conditional authorization. Is that a direction we want to go? Um, definitely interested in people's thoughts on that as well. Uh, and then just one final call out, the trampoline pod, we obviously didn't come up with it. Uh, came out, I wanna say, KubeCon two years ago. Uh, and if you wanna check your own clusters, they actually provided a tool. It's a link to the tool they provided uh, called RBAC Police. Uh, so I should have created one last slide to say Q&A, but uh, if anyone has any questions, we'll field them now. Otherwise, I think we're finished.